Good evening. Welcome to the Cabarrus County Board of Education work session for Monday, November 5th, 2018. Call to order the meeting, and I'll take a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. Second. Mr. Walter made the motion. Ms. Carpenter made the second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that's 6-0. Our first item is a report um, of the budget calendar. Ms. Klutz? Thank you. I just wanted to give you a, a quick update um, that our budget process is in underway. Um, and I wanted to give you some key dates that uh, you, you would want to put on your calendar. Um, the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so our budget committee dates for this year, we've consolidated and tried to do three full day meetings and one lunch and learn. So the first um, date that you see there is a lunch and learn on Thursday, January the 31st, and that will be for new participants to the budget committee. Um, so uh, we won't um, do the Trigo training and some of the other things that, um, that we do year to year. We'll only do that for new folks. And then we'll do our capital um, in the next meeting, the operations on technology in the third meeting, and then continuation, which is follow suit in uh, the way that we normally do that. All of the three of those are here in this boardroom. Um, that's, we always have them here. The lunch and learn will be at a separate location, a smaller, probably the training room. I haven't confirmed that yet, uh, but we'll get that out to you. Next slide is the, the meeting dates for the board meeting, meetings that will be discussed in budget. The first one would be Monday, March the 4th. Then we'll have a budget work session, um, which is generally dedicated to the budget on Thursday, March the 21st. Then we'll have the budget discussion follow-up and the public hearing on Monday, April the 1st. And then we'll ask you to adopt the proposed budget on Monday, April the 8th, so we can forward that on to the county. Easter's in March this year, right? It's earlier? Yes. Is that a trick question? No, just okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's early. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and finally, I just wanted you to see um, a list of the budget objectives that we use as an integral part of our TRIGO session. Um, these were adopted uh, by the budget committee and uh, approved by the board. Um, we made some slight modifications to the order of those from last year and the, the board um, approved those in the spring um, and we've also provided a definition for each of the budget objectives so that everybody is familiar with um, with what we're referring to okay are there any questions or concerns about our budget calendar now it just looks like we'll have the budget approved from our side before Easter it's late this year. Good. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any questions, board members? Good. Okay. I think you have the next. Oh, actually, no. It'll be separated. Uh, we'll ask uh, our board member, Mr. Shoemaker, to review what, uh, the draft of the uh, RFP. Board members, if you'll turn to the uh, the draft you should see it in your Oops, let me get it open. but anyway uh, so what I did was I followed a typical pro request for proposal that we use uh, in the construction group and then just tried to fill that out so uh, I started off with the <coughs> basic information uh, reviewing the request for proposal and then we then it divided into uh, five different, it's divided into five different areas. One is the summary of the feasibility study. Uh, the <coughs> pardon me. The second is the uh, selection schedule. And the reason I had optional, because I wasn't sure how we were going to uh, deal with the selection, so it has a lot of details of how to do the selection, so that's something we have to so have a conversation. Awesome it's just, it's, I wasn't sure, so I didn't put it in there as mandatory until we all talk about how we want to do this. So, you know, I just left it in there so that you would know there was some flexibility in this. Um, then the contact information and um, then the summary of the proposal content and then finally the summary of the evaluation. 
and you'll see that it has some exhibits in here. There's an architect information form, um, also the prior experience related form, and I put that optional because, again, I didn't know what, how much information we were going to request due to the fact that this is a very limited uh, amount of uh, work associated with this. Um, also, the minority women business enterprise questionnaire. Uh, also, the com and then I had the Cabarrus County Schools template modified AIA document, and that is standard that we use for just about any type of um, contract that we have with any architectural firms. And and I would uh, need legal assistance when we when we go down that path. Um, and finally, I've asked for some campus drawings of the Beverly Hills campus and um, so Mr. Louder and Mr. Cohn have provided me the drawings um, so we'll, uh, I'll provide those to you guys uh, next week. I just got them over the weekend so I hadn't had a chance to uh, put them out where we could do anything with them but uh, the drawings are of the facility back in 1993 when they did an expansion there was a survey done in, in 2011 so that's about the latest drawing and then there's a drawing on, on some remediation attempts for uh, asbestos. So we'll have to decide what we want to provide. My thinking is it will provide a, a nice campus survey of the whole um, of the whole campus and the and the property. So we have that as a drawing. But the, the rest of the drawings, they gave me everything from electrical to mechanical. So we have all the drawings that are associated with uh, if, if the uh, firms would need them to bid with. Um, I just put the exhibits. I didn't put the actual drawings in there because I didn't get them until... I'm going, yeah, I will reference exactly what we're going to put in there. Um, just haven't gotten there. I'll have that by next meeting. My biggest focus was on the, uh, was on the wording in this document to try to make sure that it seemed to be pretty good for you guys. So as you can see in the first paragraph, I, I kind of lay out um, the standard boilerplate um, and, and information that we sh would typically have in a, in a document like this. And um, so has anyone, have you guys had a chance to read this, this paragraph? And if you would, take a, mo a moment to read it and tell me if you have any feedback that you want to share now or if you want to wait till next uh, after this meeting to share it with me. I think I've gotten one response from David at this point on a, a little bit of feedback that he provided to me, which was a, a lot more, more of a question to answer. So I'll open it up for questions on the first page one and two. All right, let's move on. Again, you can send me questions and we can talk about it again and, uh, and I'll send you answers um, if you don't, if you need some summaries, some explanations. So then we get into the summary of the pod project and that's page three and um, talked about when the successful proposal is awarded, the firm receiving the contract shall be responsible to execute the following feasibility study scope of work. So what you'll find below is the scope of work for this project. Um, the, the, the thing that I got from the information that I received from board members that did provide me information was that they wanted it to be creative and that they wanted to review the current Beverly Hills School <coughs> and in our motion we said that we wanted to accommodate at least one of two possible scenarios. One was to house a school that was capable of housing the current 400 student capacity plus an additional 25 percent, 500 student capacity. Replacement stu schools should have a minimum of 500 student core capacity with an estimated 65-year uh, useful life, which is the current age of the existing school. Uh, it may be designed with multiple stories, capable of housing students K-5 while maintaining the focus on the current North Carolina Department of Public Instruction standards for K-5 class sizes. And in this, we're assuming that 50% of the students, just an equal distribution of students, so that was all I was trying to capture there uh, so that they would understand that, you know, they have different class sizes when they start in K5, K, K2 and then in 3-5 their class sizes change. So they would have to make sure that they had the, the type of classrooms needed to support that. Um, and then you can see the other items that I've captured was 
uh, providing space for administration and staff, provide space for preparing and feeding the school population, provide multi-use space for school instruction, sports activities that are commensurate with grades K-5, integrate outdoor playground facilities into the plan, allow all school bus movement, staff, visitor parking, and parent queuing and pickup. So they need to allow for all that. And then this school is expected to be sited on the property, which will be uh, shown in Exhibit E, which is the uh, current, current campus. There was a suggestion from Ms. Carpenter about possibly purchasing two acres of property from the, the Concord Water folks, but because we haven't entered into any conversations about anybody, I can't put that in the scope of work because you know we don't know if that even exists. So right yeah. now, I think it's prudent for us to stay with what we own, truly own, and, and keep the scope focused on that. Yeah, Mr. Shoemaker, um, I had actually inquired to Mayor Padgett when he was here one night for the public hearing uh, about the water plant. First of all, it is still an active uh, water facility. And uh, his comment was, with his experience in education and knowing the soil testing requirements, that he didn't expect we would be able to pull much, if anything, off of their property um, based on it being a, a chemical plant. So okay. um, it could certainly be looked at, but uh, coming right from the former mayor, yeah. he said it probably is not possible. Well, regardless of what we try to do with that, I, wanted, didn't, I didn't want to pollute the scope of this work with, right. with, with something that was uh, an iffy. One of the other things, and it was not mentioned in here, about moving the playground from the lower level up to the upper level and the parking down to the lower level because that's completely reversing how it is now and that would completely change the design of that because that yes. and they can do that in that right. yeah. that's, that's i haven't told them anything all i told them is that they just have to integrate all this yeah. in there and figure it out and so I, I, what I tried to do is just leave it an open door, but if I were to prescribe that you switch, then I've removed their flexibility, and I didn't want to do that. I wanted to keep it so that they come to us with the ideas, and, and they may come up with that idea. On but, their own. I mean, yeah, but they, they may not think of that either. And, but, <laughs> but with that, and the other thing is the... And it's not even mentioned about, and you're not even suggesting using existing buildings is another thing, keeping the older buildings. And That's not what we voted on, I don't believe. Nope. So. But either new buildings or the other. Um, but there again, that was one of the suggestions of keeping the older buildings possibly also. But again, Ms. Carpenter, Remember, we're asking them for the creativity. They may come up with, in the conversation, because I have the drawings for the 93 building, they may come up with and say, you know, we could integrate this building and save you some money and do this with the property. So we want them to come to us and tell us what the best approach is for this property or what they feel like is the best approach. And we'll have to, um, you know, for $20,000, that's, that's what we uh, will ask them to do. But if we start prescribing things, then we limit the study and we limit their ability to provide us an answer that I think is an objective answer rather than us trying to manipulate the answer. And that's what I was trying not to do. If, if we were asked to give feedback, why is that? Why is Ms. Carpenter's feedback not valuable? I, I think that's pretty good. A couple good suggestions to kind of throw out there as starting points. Thank, thank you, Ms. Carpenter. I think Mr. Carpenter's feedback is, is fine, except the minute you start integrating your conditions onto the uh, study, you no longer have an objective study. You have a study that's been geared a certain way, and it's, it can only come up with a very limited answer. So, I'd suggest we all go back to the original resolution that we all voted on and the terms of that resolution, and I don't recall... Um, uh, these options at that time but we are trying to demonstrate and express to the prospective architectural firms if they can be creative and if they can be suggestive about how to use existing anything that will certainly hear their 
the opportunities the opportunities that they have to offer. That's why it's a feasibility study. What is feasible, as opposed to what we might otherwise uh, be trying to uh, tack on here. I got it. So, Mr. Shoemaker, I commend you that the proposal feasibility study draft or outline here um, seems to pretty closely mirror the uh, resolution that we had and is true to the uh, intent of that, that effort we put forth a few months ago. So this, this will put some meat around the proposal and uh, we'll be able to be good stewards of the county's $20,000 and get this going so that the community in Beverly Hills can know that we're uh, following uh, our intended uh, practice and, and this will uh, actually get things going here as we as we promised. Promises made, promises kept. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, uh, so this carries us to the second one, which is the second scenario which we had in our resolution which was a, to explore the feasibility of housing a school capable of educating 400 students in grades K-5 with an additional functionality to house a department that would be located on the same property. This facility had have, shall have the same functional requirements as the facility above, so I'm kind of referring to the basic information above, and then, um, but should also include offices and meeting spaces and parking for a department that houses a, and I, I just grabbed a number of minimum 30 staff personnel because I don't know how big a department would be that would go over there, but I use that number and I think that that would be something that I would need a little input from the administration on if, if that seems to be a, a functional number, or if, if that's reasonable, then we'll leave that in there. Um, but we'd say that it would be a multi-use facility for both school and um, a possible department to be housed over there. Yes, sir. What kind of department are we talking about? Why? I'm not sure why we would need anything other than a school on that site, given how small it is. In the in the original motion, if we were to go to 400, the original motion said to have another activity, school-related activity, to be housed on the same site, <coughs> so that we would get more than just a a 400 person school out of it and that was that was the way the motion was set up so that we could have a multi-use a school plus maybe the technology department and just throwing something out of the air or, or some other department that could be housed on the site and 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 accompanied that way we would have uh, a school with some other functionality and that was that was the goal of the original uh, motion that was passed back in July, in June We at, excuse me, are we asking these firms to provide both scenarios or one of one either or? We're asking them for creativity. I'm sure that they'll I mean, they'll just, light on just one. Reading the, the last sentence of the first paragraph there. It's Which one are you looking at? On page three, first paragraph. Yep. Towards the end of it. So it's up to them to decide if they're going to do both or just one or just yeah I'm just asking them uh, for twenty thousand dollars I'm asking can you we, do, uh, we can are you asking do both for twenty thousand or just one <coughs> I don't know we'll, we'll I, I always think we would leave it to them to figure out what they could do because they're not going to do a lot of uh, engineering work other than enough to say all right this is feasible this is the kind of typical construction that we would use and then begin to price it out in, in whatever may, way they would do that. The biggest thing is to try to give some kind of design that they could throw some costs at to, to look how the site would work, especially uh, how the campus, you know, wherever you lo located the, uh, the playground facilities, how you've located the parking, um, and, you know, did they decide to use some type of other parking um, strategy to deal with parking because you know the parking at the lower level is is a long walk up so maybe they could integrate something more creative than just making people park all the way to the bottom and put the playground at the top they could possibly do some other things so the goal was just to try to see where they would go with it 
Yeah, I mean, I see the reasoning behind that. I just yeah. don't know if we're going to get both for that that amount. So, both scenarios. Mr. Shoemaker, forgive yeah. my lack of knowledge about this, but um, we often get to a phase of construction and start discussing value engineering. Would we need to uh, allude to or uh, specify anything related to value engineering at this phase for the later phases of actual construction? Well, all, all you're trying to do is get a, a an estimate that you can float reliably up to the commissioners to say, all right, here's what we think the school's going to cost. Here's a sanity check that's been provided on a design. And even though it's just an infantile look at it, you know, it's the first blush at, all right, here's what you could do. Now, when we do actually go to the, to request money, then we would have a budget that we would request money with. And then we would do a true architectural. We wouldn't necessarily use every, in, everything in this layout that they provide us because it's a high level layout they would provide us a, a a scope of you can do these things with this property but then when it comes to the detail and actually having a, an architectural firm do the design work that they would do they make drifts from the initial concept and they feel like they can even do a better job now that they've had a chance to assemble the, the nuts and bolts in the process of, of, anal of analysis they could probably do a much more detailed um, design, which may be, which may drift a little bit from what the study provides. Mr. Shoemaker, uh, just on a note on some of the recent comments, at the bottom of the first paragraph, right under summary of project, perhaps we adjust that wording to say, um, with at least one of the two possible scenarios presented, okay. just with to give an option if a firm did want to say we could tackle here's options A, B, and C, and it met either or both okay. of those options, we'd be happy to review it. Yep, I'll put that in. All right, so after you get past option two, then you have um, just some information about what we expect out of the lead architectural consultant and that they should assemble a team of engineering consultants. And this is people that would, they, they probably should have it, but it may include uh, civil, structural, architectural, fire protection, plumbing, mechanical, electrical, electronic, and kitchen um, specialists and engineers. Um, the scope of work may limit pre-designed services such as planning and programming. So we're not going to be out there doing a lot of programming and pre-planning for this so that they'll have to do all of that work. Um, the scope shall, cons shall include the design and administrative services on the property drawing site and it's important to note that the outputs of the study may will be used to create future documents for the Beverly Hills elementary school replacement project. This is a part where, Richard, I'll need your assistance, but I want those, those drawings should be our property, and we should be able to use those and share those in any future projects that we may do on that so that, you know, we can use that as reference. I was waiting to uh, get to an appropriate breaking point to see if this has had legal review yet. We have not reviewed it. I don't know if the Hartzell firm has, but this needs legal review. <laughs> So that was a, a point of that whatever it is, we own it, we can share it, and when, when, we do, when we deem it appropriate to do the replacement school, then at least we can say, all right, here's a, here's a copy of the study, the drawings and everything that was performed, and now um, then the next firm will come on board and use that as the starting point from, you know, and they'll, and they'll do whatever they want you know, as far as within the budget that they, they're provided. So they may not follow the design exactly, but at least they'll have an idea of um, what someone else has put into it, and we'll get to share that information. And I wanted to make sure that was shared. All right, that carries us to page four. Um, I reemphasize that there's no programming for the space. 
So we're not going to provide them programming. They'll have to go to DPI. They have to have knowledge of elementary schools, of, of how the space is uh, um, supposed to be designed for, the square footage requirements for K2, the class size requirements, the, the size requirements for the cafeterias, for all that. That's all that they'll have to provide for during their, during their um, study. And then we want them to also include the estimated cost of demolition on the property, the estimated costs to construct the facility, the pros and cons of building on the current campus, and we would like a design that could be creative uh, and possibly a multi-level facility. Uh, we wanted to show creativity to allow all bus, school, <laughs> school bus movement, staff visitor parking, um, as well as parent pickup pick could be accommodated on the current ca campus site with consideration to the um, surrounding neighborhoods. And then we wanted to make sure that we had some type of high level options for the site in each scenario with sketches helping to detail the approach. Um, we would also like them to detail what the programming assumptions are so when they do say that we have X number of classrooms, we know how they got to that number and what they were using as their assumptions in, in that. Um, we'd like them to itemize any potential construction risks and limitations with the property in relation to the surrounding properties, the site grade, potential floodplain issues, uh, to assess water, sewer, and electrical infrastructure to support the scenarios that they provide, and then <coughs> the estimated building costs. And again, I just kind of re review the potential demolition costs, site preparation, grading costs, construction costs, and also to include the estimates for kitchen equipment, athletic facility equipment. Furnitures, fixtures, and electronics, which we typically call FF&E, would not be included in the construction costs, and these should be uh, listed separately. And they can put down a general estimate for that. We did not want to include cost of computers and technology equipment because that usually is covered in a different way. Mr. Shoemaker, mm -hmm. do we even need that furniture fixtures because we usually determine that that budget? We can uh, strike that if you want. I don't think we need the architects to provide that. Okay. I will get rid of that sentence. Does anybody else feel the same way? I agree. I agree. Other I agree. Than would, it be different, would it be different if it's a full school or if it's used for staff? I think our staff has some general numbers. They use or percentages and whatnot based on school population. Kelly's shaking her head, yes. So we could just leave that be yeah. based on what they provide as scenarios. And so the one other thing I've asked, the, asked them to estimate the cost in 2018 dollars. And the reason I want them to draw a line in the sand on the cost is regardless of when this project finally comes to fruition, we need to know how to inflate accordingly because if you, if you say that the project is going to be a 2020, 2022, 2024, I don't know when, you've got to be able to give the, the um, commissioners a realistic estimate and you have to know how to inflate the project a little bit. So we want to make sure we know a kind of standard that they use for, for, for their estimate. Mr. Schumacher. Yes, sir. Um, estimates of costs of demolition and then your uh, next to last item down here about the breakout of the potential um, demolitions costs um, I'm just you know I'm just speculating is there a possibility that some of the uh, soil there needs to be tested or uh, carry, that would be carried away it or does this is this all inclusive about the entire no, that would be preparation of the entire uh, uh, plot of land the twenty thousand dollars isn't going to allow us to do that. no I don't mean actually do it but in terms of the discussion and the estimates Oh, to do the site, the official survey and the soil yeah, testing yeah, yeah. in the estimates. To calculate, not, the, not those expenses. Oh, okay. but not to do them, but just include the costs. Okay. You want to make sure the land is okay, pristine, for lack of a better word, um, so that we can maximize the um, actual implementation of some plan there. I just don't want some other expense to pop up that we didn't anticipate or didn't put in here and mm -hmm. obligate the architectural firm to account for. Like rock, <laughs> stuff like that. Okay. So I asked for soil testing 
and uh, additional site costs. Mm -hmm. Mr. Shoemaker? Yes, sir. Do you want, uh, uh, in that breakout, do you want kitchen equipment and athletic facility equipment being re recommended or estimated by the architect? Or do you want the staff to do that? Well, when I talk about kitchen equipment, it's your hoods, your, your install, and, and unless, usually we, when we have an architect that comes in, they, they, they connect with a, an engineering firm, and then usually there's a special kitchen firm that comes in, and they provide the cooking and, and um, subsequent food preparation equipment at a large level. So it's like the, the ranges and the, the setups that go along with it, the fume hoods and the, you know, the um, Ansel fire protection that goes with that. It have, you have to have some basic kitchen design to get an estimate of how much you're going to do kitchen-wise. So they, they may just do a quick layout, but they, they, would, they would know kind of what they needed to, to purchase. Now, they don't have to have a kitchen uh, specialist come in. They might have enough experience <coughs> themselves to do it and not have to have that. But we would want those costs in there because then that means now we have to go figure out this is a gap. And someone in the staff has to figure out how to, how to take care of... Uh, providing a kitchen, an industrialized kitchen. And I don't think that that's something that our staff's equipped to do. And for, and for, an athlete, for uh, athletic facility equipment for an elementary school, I'm, if I'm a design firm, I'm wondering what you're, asking, what you're looking for there. And I would, think, I would think it would be potential playground equipment, but especially like inside a gym, you might have basketball goals that would be suspended from the ceiling. You might have pads on the walls. I don't think there would be a whole, I wouldn't look for, you know, the ball rack and the balls and the different sundry items, but the, the capital items that would um, take care of the, the gymnasium, the structural it. building equipment. One thing that, Is that I, on the, you on want the, me to spell it out more? Wait a minute, let me just, oh, okay. Because I'm, I'm just thinking for a $20,000 design proposal. That's get, that's getting a lot more nitty gritty than mm -hmm. I think you're you're going to be uh, looking for or expecting to get. Okay. All but right. it's totally up to you. All right. Well, totally up to the board. Do y'all want me to remove the athletic equipment? I I don't know if it's it's good for us not to have at least a budgetary estimate for the um, kitchen equipment, just because that's a big cost item. You know. And honestly, the, one of the reasons we talk about um, the larger schools being more economically feasible is because those core areas, um, the cost of them is diluted over more students who can attend the school as opposed to a smaller school where we have that same amount of money spent for a much smaller student population. Um, so I, I think we need to have some level, so maybe something in the middle, Rich, between what you and Barry are talking about, we need to have something included in that potential estimate. Certainly not the details of every piece, but I think most architects who've constructed schools before um, would have some um, estimates at hand on what it takes to build a core area of certain volume. Right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take out the athletic equipment. As far as the estimates for the qu kitchen equipment, they can, I'm, I'm sure that there's some uh, rules of thumb that they use for based on core sizes and, and the preparation that they have to provide each day. One thing on the core size. Yes, ma'am. I had put 550 in there and the reason I put the 550 in there was because of the cropper study. Uh, if you look at that, Beverly Hills was one of the few that showed growth, and that was why I put that 550 figure in there. They are showing growth where <coughs> some of those other schools are not showing growth, and they were actually showing physical growth. Yeah, I think, Ms. Carpenter, if you think about that there are approximately, I believe, 100 students there for um, magnet program choice. Um, it's not the students in that location, but including the local students and the magnet students. But in that 
actual subdivision they are getting in that actual area, those individuals, it's not older people buying those homes. It is actually younger people with children that are coming into that that area. So there are people with children coming in there. So they are showing, if you look at their demographics, it is actual young people coming into that area. If you look at the demographic and study. And this does say a minimum 500 student core, so. Uh, yeah, but it's, but I'm saying for that growth, if look at their demographics. Yeah, well, I think the goal is that we're following the approved proposal. So we need to stay true to that. If we alter that now, then we're not holding true to our word. So, but the minimum will cover what you're asking. I mean, could I, could I put a dash, put, uh, does the replacement school shall have a core capacity of 500 to 550? I think we need to stick with the... What's the current enrollment? It's actually down a little bit this year, I think. 387, something like that. Can you pull the original... I would like to know the original motion, please. Can we pull that? Because you keep mentioning about the original motion... And I'd like to hear the original motion. Okay, well, we're not voting on the proposal tonight, so that can be looked up now. Okay, I'd like to have because I, you keep referring to the original <coughs> motion, and I don't think the original motion talked about having both of the studies done, and I don't think you, you keep referring to that, and I don't think that's actually what was said, so... You know, I'd like to hear the original motion on that. Okay, and we can look back to it, the minutes from June 28th meeting, I believe it was. Yeah, because, you know, I, I want to stay true to word, too, but I, I, you know, I don't think that's what was actually said. And, like I say, that, that study with the demographics, they are, they're saying there's growth. What was that, what was the numbers on that? What was the numbers? What they got 373. They're down that many now. Well, if that's, um, I just want to make sure for the growth that we've got that. If if five will do it, then that's fine. But so I I just want to make sure because they do show that the, the 360 includes any kids from out of that district that are st STEM kids or whatever. Okay. How but I would like to see that original motion myself to make sure that we are. Okay, that's fine with that. What's the most kids that have been at Beverly Hills in the last five years? Anybody know off the top of their head? We were up to four something at one time. Yeah, with the program choice. Okay, so we're proposing to get somebody to give us a general ballpark figure of what it would cost to build a school bigger than we need, essentially. We've not needed for more than 420 in the last five years, but we're going to get them to give us a proposal for 500. I think, I think that's a little... Well, I think, I think we're can, just trying to kill it, honestly. But you can increase the program choice availability. And I believe just the proposal specifies that it can be a multi-tiered uh, design, possibly. Mr. Schumacher, do you want to continue? to be on Commissioner's August agenda for funding approval, which was approved. Design must achieve a minimum of 25% building core capacity 
growth or it must meet the current building capacity and provide space for other distinct functions such as technology department. Provide an estimate of building a new facility on the previous EHES site. Okay, so, so that's all it said then. Right, so that carries us to um, the, the selection schedule and um, this Pertenbaugh provided us the selection schedule. Right now we're uh, moving towards January 2019. As you can see, I haven't <coughs> filled in all the dates because it all depends on when we get this finished as to when we can start the process. So once we get this approved, then we can fill in the dates and start um, putting, putting forth the, uh, begin, you know, solicit for selection. And I received a listing today of potential of different groups that uh, bid on the current Hickory Ridge Elementary School. So I have those, and then of course we'll open it up to the public for um, others to, to uh, decide to bid if they wish, or not bid, but provide a proposal. <laughs> so go to page six. Right now, I'm the contact until we ha have our new board set seated, and then we'll add to our uh, committee. <coughs> and then we have the summary of the proposal, and, um, and we have exhibits in here to support that. This kind of gives you the uh, outline for <coughs> what they should provi provide, some of their past history, uh, a little bit about their approach to the project and any prior related experience with elementary schools. And then we have a um, typical contract will be the AIA contract, Rich, is what I would use as our typical one on page seven, item seven, which I think is what we use just about for everything now. And then um, we're going to limp these proposals to 12 pages, <coughs> which don't include the um, cover letter or exhibits A through D. So they have 12 pages to explain their approach to the project. I don't know how many hard copies we need, but uh, right now we have it down. We have it basically five bound hard copies and one electronic. So if y'all think we need to change that, just let me know. If everybody needs a copy, that's fine too. I'll go. I'll get stuff put down seven. Yeah, I think we can probably do most of it digital. I would hate to have the firms have extra expense and focus the money instead on the content of a response. Well, are we putting this out for actual formal type, or one of the things? I personally do not feel that we need to, that we should have people that are currently building for us right now because we want this to be an unbiased type, a third party type thing. Um, I mean, just somebody that has, it, you know, have experience in, ed, you know, elementary schools, uh, that type of thing. but somebody that is working for us now I I just don't feel like that that's unbiased is my my opinion on it I don't feel like that I think we should have somebody that's not working for us now but that's just my opinion um, other ones what is unbiasing feel? about that Carolyn huh what makes that Un, unbiased well we've got plenty biased. of architects out there right now that uh, that have uh, a lot of and it's not like it's one of these multi million dollar contracts this is a very small contract and we've got plenty of architects out there that have a lot of expertise in the area and this is a very small contract and I know that they are capable of doing the work and like I say, we've got other ones that are doing, you know, a lot of our elementary schools, high schools, and everything like that. 
and I, you know, we have said we want this to be a very unbiased type thing, something that is, you know, not going to have, you know, that's going to be, you know, unbiased, you know, a third party that's looking at this with no strings attached whatsoever. And I just think it's better if it's not somebody that's working for us right now doing some of our buildings and everything. Um, not doing one of our big schools like, you know, where we've got two big schools right now that people are working on. So, um, didn't we get ourselves into a pickle um, recently about not having enough bids? In a, in a, for construction, I think. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I'm not sure what the advantage is of constricting or limiting or reducing the range or number of potential bids. I mean, it, it's $20,000 and, it's, and it's, it's a, 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 a plan and uh, how many proposals do we want or do we not want? Well, how are we, we, we going to rate them? We, we may only get one or two. It's not a exactly. Uh, so if we uh, add all sorts of seven. requirements or specifications, we'll uh, potentially okay. limit it even more. We want to make sure we get as many feasible bids as possible. It looks like this. Please, it's, it's not a bid, it's a proposal. Yeah. There you go. I think I agree with David. I don't. I, I think that having somebody participate that's already doing work for us may make it more affordable. They already know kind of what we expect and that sort of thing. It might make it might make it much easier for them to meet our expectations. So I don't, I don't want to eliminate anybody. But yeah, I, I think up front we just need to keep it open. Then we can make an evaluation when we get the initial responses. So, once we receive receive them, then we'll have to judge these by some summary evaluation. And you can see the basic way we're going to review um, each of the um, proposals. And we'll use a project approach. We'll use the professional qualifications and then any performance and relationships um, with uh, different subs and teams around uh, North Carolina. So we'll look at who they would, who they would help them, have them help them with this project to say, all right, well, it looks like this group has a really good uh, team, but we'll use this as our, as our way to kind of judge the proposals. All right. So after that, you just get into the exhibits. You have exhibit A, which is the architect's information form. And that goes to page 12, where you have exhibit B, which is the prior related experience, uh, different schools that they've done work on and projects that they've done work on. And then you go to the um, minority women business enterprise questionnaire. And then exhibit D would include <coughs> some of the campus drawings, some of the building drawings, so that they, they will have an idea of, of what the campus at Beverly Hills has, what the, what the current buildings have, uh, and, and give them an enlightened view of, of the current state that they have in front of them. Of course, these are all, the, the, the most current drawing out there is a, is a survey that was done in, 19, in 2011. The rest of the drawings are from 1993, so. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of current drawings for that site as far as big projects that were done. Yes, sir. Has Tim Lauder reviewed this? Tim, have you seen this? Yes, staff is intentionally not involved because of the concern by the community uh, that staff had a bias. Okay. So. so they are only providing us factual information such as uh, templates, the listing of the architects previously used, and so on. Okay, Mr. Shoemaker, what was, mm -hmm. um, I know we want to have this available <coughs> for firms at the beginning of January, so we need to, I guess, firm this up, have it legally reviewed. Yep. Um, 
do we need to vote in November to go forward, uh, or can we wait until December? I'm just thinking from the standpoint of new board members being seated potentially, well, at least one for Dr. Kerr. But yeah, so I I think that if we can vote on the structure of this in the November meeting, and then get who we would like for the um, the you know to what what else we want in the uh, submission. And we can go ahead and uh, have that released in December. If we could, if you could wait to the first week in December, I would appreciate it because I would like to vote. The work session meeting? No, the first meeting. Yes, yeah, that's the. the well, we don't want to vote the first session. meeting because don't forget we'll have at least one new board member then, um, because we have one person not running. So. But if we don't, you know, there. Uh, we don't like to do a vote that you know any push any votes that first night. I don't see anything, if we let it slide a month because of the the, the new board, we but could still get everything started before the end of January. Right, because we, we need to make sure we pay, for Ms. Cleth's sake, Please. that we <laughs> receive the invoice from the, the firm who's awarded right. the request um, and that we pay the invoice in April. So. No later, yeah. The invoice in April, no later than May, right? right. Yeah. So that's the big thing is okay. have that all finished. Okay, so uh, let's, t I guess, take another look at whatever revisions mm -hmm. um, at next week's meeting. They won't, so Mindy, no vote next week, or in two weeks when we have our meeting. Um, but oh. we will do a more of a report on what's the status, anything yeah. new we found out. And I'll provide this document with, with red lines on it so you'll know what, if we change anything else. Okay. All right. Any other questions, board members? Feel free to give, uh, send Mr. Shoemaker any additional feedback uh, within a week, so that would give him a week to finalize and consolidate any other changes we might suggest. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. And I, I would like to uh, recognize Deputy Matthew Wilson from Boger Elementary School, who is here. Thank you for joining us this evening. And we will move on to um, items for consideration for the consent agenda. First up is budget amendments. Yes, thank you. I have, I think, uh, three or four budget amendments for you, starting with the state. Um, as you can see, uh, an increase of overall 538,651 to the state budget. Many of those are uh, planned and expected. Um, the ones that I'll call your, to your attention specifically, um, in the middle of the page are bonus pay and benefits for the principal bonuses, $94,732. Going to our principals um, because of their bonuses, their achievements. Um, in addition, I would call to your attention the 134085 um, for the state safety equipment grant. And so that's the grant we applied for um, and we uh, were awarded that grant for safety equipment. So great news there. Finally, I'm sorry, the safety equipment. Ms. Reimer, you'll articulate it a little bit better. I have the document, <laughs> but I'm sure she'll say it. Just, right. just a summary. I don't it's Oh, it's the, for the reunification crisis response trailer, there's about $19,000 for that. Um, number of school exteriors, looks like uh, reflective light numbers um, for, for 40 schools, $30,000 for that. Um, sorry. There's um, tournament, tourniquet kits um, and cabinets, $34,000. And then there's tinted window film for $85,000. So that's your hundred. Yeah, the district safety team looked at all that. Okay. Yeah, so there's um, a little bit more here. Than and we, yeah, we asked yeah. for 165,000. We were awarded 134,000. They did not fund the actual tourniquets. Oh, they didn't. Uh, not sure about some tourniquets. of that, but okay. um, uh, most of it is for just direct school safety, putting uh, <clears throat> some uh, clear numbers on the windows from outside, so our emergency response folks would be able to see that, what floor, what be able to identify areas quickly. Some. Um, film that you put over the window that's uh can't see in but you can see out kind of film especially in some of our 
spaces that are easel, easel, easily seen from the road or areas like that. So, um, and then a reunification kit for the district to respond if we were to have any kind of situation at any one school, we'd be able to meet a school wherever <coughs> we may evacuate to to help support them in those areas. Miss hmm. Carpenter was also part of that, so she uh, part of our district safety team and was part of the decision making around all those things. Okay, are there any questions on this, the state budget amendment? Okay, we'll move forward to the federal one. We'll do um, a reclass there for Title I, um, the addition of some IDEA preschool funds, 20400 27400 and then another reclass there for federal funds. Okay, next one is capital. Um, this is just where uh, the Board of Education approved the 600000 of uh, contingency for the elementary school on September the 10th. The commissioners approved it on September the 17th, and this is just the, the recording of that transaction. Okay, and finally, there's a, a Confucius grant um, that was um, to the schools listed there, uh, $15,000. Okay, are there any other questions? Board members consent agenda. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Okay, next we have 4.02 regarding adding a 457 plan for our employees. Yes, this is the um, state 457 plan. We currently have the 401k plan and the 403b plan that the state sponsors. Um, and we would like to add the 457 <coughs> as an option for our employees. Um, we're seeing the need primarily for employees that have transferred from other districts who would like to transfer their fund, their money into the, the same plan. Are there any questions? Okay, if you'll notice, the second attachment is a resolution which we need to provide for Ms. Clutz to provide to the state. Yeah, can we put that on action though since it's a resolution? <clears throat> um, sure. Thanks. So this is gonna help us in recruiting, is that part of the goal to this? or? How is it? It's not necessarily with recruiting. It's just that some of the employees that we are hiring from other districts have chosen this option as one of their state benefits instead of... But that's something you can promote when you go out to wherever? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So currently the employees that have a 50, 457 plan that come here have to do something different with their money? And, and no, we... We, we, have, the microphone? we have 457s available for employees. Um, this is just the state-specific 457. We believe our 457 is a, a great ample plan. Um, okay. This is just another option. There are... <laughs> oh, so this, one, this one's managed by the state. Yes. This one's managed okay. by the state, and, and some folks would, would like to continue to keep their money in the state. Um, we have a great option. So it doesn't cost, this isn't costing us anything to do this? No, or? sir, it doesn't cost us anything. Okay, so that will be on the action agenda. Okay. <coughs> and next we'll welcome Ms. Reimer and Ms. Burns. It's your turn. <laughs> for 4.03 policies for approval on the first reading. Isn't that second reading? This is first read. These are first. These are first read. There was an error originally on one of the lines in the agenda, and that was corrected today. Okay, I'm going to begin with 1730, 4022, 7230, non discrimination on the basis of disabilities. This is a re an attorney recommended revision and clarifies the parent's right and procedural safeguards, including a following a formal grievance, requesting an impartial hearing, and or filing a complaint with the Office of Civil Rights. Any comments, board members? Was this purely on um, attorney's recommendation, or is it does it concur with uh, the NCSBA or any other authority that we? Strictly our attorney. Okay. Okay. It says establish and implement a procedure for system of procedural safeguards. What are procedural safeguards? I'll defer, defer, defer to. I'm sorry. What was the question, please? Um, it says establish and implement. You're adding this number nine. So it says establish and implement a system of procedural safeguards. 
and I just question was what are the procedural safeguards? Is that kind of does that go on uh, that sentence, or can you explain that a little better? This the procedural safeguards would be developed um, as an administrative regulation um, by the superintendent. This is based on um, an OCR regulation. The the Office for Civil Rights says that for identification, evaluation, and educational placement under Section 504, um, that uh, parents are entitled to a hearing with an independent hearing officer. Um, and uh, OCR interprets that to mean an impartial hearing officer that is not somebody employed by the district. Um, and uh, that it can't be based on or part of your standard grievance procedures. So the idea here in, in adding this is that we would establish and implement a, a system of procedural safeguards for those things that OCR says folks are entitled to a separate hearing on, dealing with identification, evaluation, or educational placement <coughs> for a student under a Section 504 plan. So who provides this? independent person because wouldn't we still end up paying for it yes we and we have we, we had a a, a a hearing about two months ago you may remember um, I don't want to call the name of the family uh, but there was a hearing and we had we had an independent hearing officer an attorney from Winston-Salem who was hired who came in we're still waiting for that decision in that case but um, uh, we've already done this uh, based on this interpretation. So what this is doing is suggesting an addition to policy that would be in compliance with OCR's interpretation of its guidelines. And by necessity, does the uh, person who performs this activity have to be an attorney, or is, could we borrow somebody from Charlotte next door or somebody who's got does not have to be an attorney, but anytime you get to a hearing like this, you're going to be dealing with legal issues. Yeah. Um, it would certainly be advisable to be an attorney. I, I would, it'd have to be a really peculiar case for us to suggest somebody who's not an attorney um, to conduct a hearing on this, because it's a really formal hearing. Right. I'm just I'm debating on whether I want to put this on action because I have some questions I'd like to ask um, separately. Um, yeah. Okay, policy 5010, <clears throat> parent organizations. These are PLS optional and recommended revisions. Significantly revises the policy to strengthen requirements for parent organizations to operate adds a provision in Section A to clarify that participation in parent organization is always voluntary, adds information in Section B to explicitly prohibit parent organizations from representing themselves as officials, representatives of the school system. Section B requires a superintendent to provide the board with a list of approved parent organizations annually, adds a new Section C with fund management rules for parent organizations, removes details from Section D that are already addressed in Policy 8220 gifts and bequests, it includes minor editorial changes. I was actually glad to see this because sometimes we have, um, especially in the Boosters Club area, um, folks who get very zealous about their mission to help the particular area, the athletic team, um, the cheerleaders, the band, uh, whichever organization they're supporting, and sometimes they represent themselves as you must do. It's a rule. Um, and it's not a rule. <laughs> so. Any other questions or comments on this one? I had somebody reach out to me on a couple of questions. That, um, one was related to C, if you can insert under the second paragraph. They're set up as two co-treasurers on signing checks. If that's acceptable, I'd like to continue that practice. Uh, I guess it already occurs in our school. So, Could you repeat that, please? It Mr. says, parent organization funds shall be deposited only into accounts maintained by the organization. All checks must be signed by the organization treasurer and either the organization president or vice president. The way this one is set up, it has two co-treasurers who both have to sign the check. No, no, no. That's an 
internal can't be two officers? No, that, that's an internal control procedure, and we would not want to change that. And so we're the same but way. We'll change where this was not in here before it is now. But we have internal controls in our schools and everything we, that we do. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, that's a strong internal control that you wouldn't want to change because what you want is the person that knows the financial components, which is the treasurer, mm -hmm. being aware of a transaction and the highest level administrator to be aware and approve the transaction. So those two different roles are important. Yeah, I'm just telling you, the comment that came back to me was that the way this organization was I'm going to recommend using, that you not. They're using two co traders Not so. change that. Which is, um, and then the other thing had to do with carrying a bond for the officers mm -hmm. of the policy. Hold, hold on, you, you're saying there's an organization that has co-treasurers and they are both required and those are the only required signatures on that check. I, that, the, I can't tell you the details, but that's what I was told. Yeah. That's the way it was? Okay, yeah, yeah that's not right. The, the bond, you mentioned to the bond. <clears throat> Beats me, okay, I'm just, what about the bond? You, you mentioned something about the bond, what was the concern? They're required to carry insurance or bond? Officers of the so I think that's a good policy. Uh, Cabarrus County Schools uh, has a bond on anyone that um, that. But does the organization pay. have to pay for that, or is that? Absolutely, yes, yes. And that's in here, or that's not somewhere else? Um, I don't know. It's not is in it? here. Yeah, I think I saw. If it's not in here, then it's. So you're saying I thought you were asking in? to take it out. Uh, no, I was asking the question. Is it? again. These are so comments that came, came to me, and I'm trying to an get those answered. So someone was suggesting that we put that in? Is that the comment? The question is, where is that? And I said, I don't know. Where is that requirement? Where is the requirement? It may be a requirement just by that particular organization based on the amount of okay, money. So, for example, some of the high school booster clubs have significant dollars um, that they're managing, and they may have done that on, on themselves. So, is there a requirement of the school system or isn't it? If it, it is not in the policy that I'm aware of, <clears throat> this policy, right. and I thought you were telling me that it was. I'm not telling you it was. <laughs> You're telling me that it's something that should be in there. I'm uh, telling you that if, if the school board association suggests that there be a bond, I yeah. would not take that out is what okay. I'm trying to well, say. Apparently they did not. So. Okay, then we're okay. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have another administrative guidelines that talks about that or not? Now, I'm just telling you, in our practice, um, that's for us. Let's see. So that's for, in our, so our board policy and for Cabarrus County School employees that deal with financial, um, they're bonded. We're bonded. Okay, but the, we're talking about parent organizations here. Right, and so, but this policy doesn't, this doesn't address parent organizations, correct? Mr. Walter, if you would uh, send those questions to us, we'd be happy to research that for you this week and, and try to get you some answers before next week and we can put that on action if you'd like, okay? Okay, and the other question had to do with uh, items that were donated and who maintains that? So, items that are donated, if they're donated, they are property of Cabarrus County School and our policy does state that. So, then, if the pro there are property, it's up to us to maintain this? Yes, we insure them. We, we insure them and we, okay. Mm -hmm. we do. But when you say maintain them, I'm just thinking about band, for example. If somebody donates. Well, that's where this came from. I mean, yeah, this came if somebody from donates a trailer for band use, we don't maintain the trailer. It's according to policy. It's our property. It's it our is, property. It is our property. Mm -hmm. and it's okay, so yes, they're not just lending it for the course. If they really give it to us, it is, a, it is then ours. we maintain it. Okay. Now, you know, Same with in, in, instruments as well. Is that something? Well, we maintain them just like we maintain all of our buildings, right? So all of our buildings have a list of maintenance needs this long, and we get this much done, right? So that doesn't mean that just because somebody buys it and gives it to us, it's going to get fully, it's going to be fully maintained. Mm -hmm. But it goes on the list just like everything else. Okay. Well, thank you. That's, those are clarifications that were asked to me, and I'll okay. forward those on to Lynn. Okay. So we'll leave 5010 for action as well. Rob? Yeah. Okay. Okay, and finally, 5030 Community Use of Facilities. This is a board request for review. Uh, it was sent back to policy. We did meet uh, with policy on this, uh, policy committee on this uh, policy twice. We added uh, some more principles that are dealing directly with some of the concerns within <coughs> the policy. So 
Uh, in looking at the policy, we clarify groups and school clubs' priority and use. We clarify expectations for facility use fees. We clarify discounts for fees. We add users that may not be able to sublet or assign uh, the use privileges. Uh, use is permitted only by those who submit an application. Those are the major changes. I think the committee felt like the policy in general, as well as our attorneys, felt like the policy in general was uh, written pretty well with a few changes. The actual fee structure itself is not part of the policy and would be a uh, different discussion. Okay. Um, one item I wanted to clarify on is uh, under capital letter B, priority and use. It refers to school clubs. Um, some of the schools, I'll say somewhat generally, refer to school clubs as anything that happens after school. It could be the chess club, could be the chorus, uh, could be something else at the school. Um, a business who comes into the school is not a school club. It may be referred to generally as a school club based on it happens right after school when kids dismiss to a certain room or the gym or whatever. Um, but I think it's important that we understand that school clubs are not businesses, profit or nonprofit, who come in after school where children sign up for something and they pay a fee outside of the school. Uh, policy 3620 as, uh, speaks to that, and we can link and use hopefully the same language. We can work on that this week if that the board so wishes. You said 3620? 3620, yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, so um, board members, um, I have talked with Ms. Klutz over the past week uh, looking for an opportunity where we can narrow down um, the use fees to a certain time frame, a certain segment of organizations, uh, and share that information with you. Um, and uh, the proposal was, which Kelly said it could work with a very limited scope, and that is to add an additional 10% on top of the youth group, 50% reduction in fee uh, for activities that happen immediately after school only for the students of that school, uh, meaning there's no traffic inside, in or out of the building by children who have not been at that school. Um, and it would conclude within 90 minutes. So basically while there's still other staff members on site, to Mr. Powell's point at our last meeting, say, well, some staff is there anyways. <coughs> so there's still someone in the building um, at that point, typically the custodian, but there's still someone in the building. So just, uh, I emailed that to you, uh, feedback, thoughts on adding this, another special provision. We would have to have this policy updated for mm -hmm. the next meeting. I've got um, some thoughts on adding a, uh, another provision as well. Um, maybe under section D, I think it would be appropriate to maybe put something in there. I've got some language uh, that maybe would be interesting. It says um, school principals may choose to waive usage fees at their schools for after school enrichment programs that enhance, align with, and support the goals of the school and whose primary meeting time falls within the regular operating hours of the school building. I think that may cover um, any after school enrichment program and it again puts the responsibility back on the principal to make sure that program is actually enriching um, their school based on the goals that they have. Thank you. Ms. Harrison? Can you, I was just, I was, Vince, could you read that again? Because I did not catch I'm all sorry, that. I went a little quick. School principals may choose to waive usage fees at their schools for after school enrichment programs that enhance align with and support the goals of the school and whose primary meeting time falls within the regular operating hours of the school building. It's a little bit long for one sentence. Was that what the last, would you read the last part again, please, after support the goals of the school? support the goals of the school and whose primary meeting time falls within the regular operating hours of the school building. 
Mr. Schumacher, you had a question or can I jump in? You may, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, in theory, uh, Mr. Powell, would that mean that a, a facility would work out to be a a a, a, a free facility that that the by the principal's determination there would be no charge at all for that facility? I, I just I'm just in that scenario would it would there be a zero charge for that facility, whereas by other calculations there would be some charge? I think usage fees um, are one thing and there's other types of fees involved if there are direct expenses for the school but given the fact that they're after school activities there wouldn't be any direct usage fees so I think it would be um, essentially a free opportunity if this if the principal deems it appropriate and enhancing what they're doing at the school so what would be a kind of scenario that would fall into that category can you give me an example in your thinking one Please. is um, girls on the run which I think we've heard from them um, they don't really use the school building at all um, in the best case scenario I mean there's an occasional uh, use during rain or whatever and they actually have staff members that volunteer to be mentors uh, with the girls that are running and so they're it's more like a mentoring type program uh, than it is necessarily a running uh, like training program but uh, that would be one where it's very difficult to calculate what their usage of the building is um, and what the direct cost would be for that so it gives the principal a little flexibility um, it's they're clearly going through the fee structure uh, the paperwork so they um, abide by all the guidelines we set for them but it just says you know you're not you're not going to use or we're not going to charge you to come in here and work positively with our kids there's other examples i think but i think maybe that's yeah, I a think pretty good one yeah why why do they in charge cases, yeah. if they are such a great organ why do they charge the students then in that's some, what i gotta ask in some cases they do and in a lot of cases they scholarship them as well so I, I think that it, it's both ways if you are able to pay then you pay and if you aren't then you don't now I'm not you know representative of girls on the run I'm just reading what all we have read that has been sent to us and that's my understanding of what has been sent to us um, my only comment uh, and I would again defer to our attorney is consistency for our principals and on behalf of our principals that's all I ask um, a lot of times as a principal you're faced with a lot of different things and uh, deciding which group we're going to run a fee for and which group we're not is going to be pretty difficult for me as a principal it would have been so I would defer to our attorney to see um, what kind of position we're putting them in well and I'll use the example of the who were required to pay fees, the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, who have wanted to use our facilities. So um, if it comes down to personal opinion, I think that's why we have policies. So a lot of these details are not personal opinion. So. I'm not aware of them being an after school activity. It's usually a, a later in the evening when there's not staff available at elementary schools and so forth. So yeah, apparently I don't think it applies. some of them were and they were going to have to pay fees. Well, that'd be fine. That's up to the principal to decide. I think giving the principal that authority is um, is appropriate. Yeah. yeah, except they're not paying the bills, right, Kelly? <laughs> Other comments? Did we get our legal opinion on Ms. Reimer's question? I, I would be concerned about the consistency of implementation if you didn't have any more guidance than this, but uh, uh, you know, it would be up to the board if you wanted to put something like that into the policy. Okay, I'd like to hear from Ms. Klutz because uh, of the, the cost of keeping a school open and sometimes delaying janitorial services and whatnot. Um, and keep in mind that this would imply that a principal or even our board if we say it has to be consistent um, that we are spending the taxpayers money for some organizations 
but not for other organizations. And then how, where do you draw the line? Girls on the Run is nonprofit, other ones are not. And so where do you draw the line um, without having some structure to it? Um, so I, I have the same concerns as Ms. Reiner. I've been sitting through a lot of these meetings um, with a lot of folks, a lot of principals around the table. Um, my understanding is our principals don't want the authority to make those decisions <clears throat> because they're going to have in inconsistent application um, over and they're going to have pressure um, to support something that they don't necessarily need to support or want to support. Um, but don't want to tell organizations no or, or charge or be inconsistent with someone else. So I think this backs our principals into a corner. Um, I don't think um, we should do that to them. Um, Cost-wise, of course, there is, um, you can argue, and we can um, spend a lot of money to do an intense calculation to determine how much the actual cost is. Um, but w when I do a quick, um, kind of back of the napkin calculation, or even if you just kind of logic through it, um, most folks realize that anytime you use something, there's going to be a cost associated with it. Right? So even if we can <coughs> extend our example to something like um, maybe Mr. Powell, um, I'd like to use your, your vehicle, your personal vehicle, um, and I want to run an Uber service with it. Right, and I'll do that after you go to bed at night. So if, you, if you're done with your car at 10 o'clock, I'll run an Uber service and I will make money on that Uber service. Um, but I'm gonna put the wear and tear on your car, I'm gonna run your tires, I'm gonna run your gas, I'm gonna put your insurance at risk, I'm gonna do all of those things so that I can make money. I'm gonna return it to you at the end of the night um, and then potentially it wouldn't be available for you when you needed that, maybe to take your child to the emergency room in the middle of the night. So we can argue that there's no cost associated with, with allowing folks to use our facility, but in actuality it's not true. There are costs associated with it, and if we need to do an extensive survey um, to determine you know, the capitalization um, process, and so a building worth $40 million, if we need to get down to the actual usage number of hours for the school use versus number of hours for other programs. We can capitalize that, we can pull that out. Um, utilities, hour for hour, building for building, um, meters, separate meters, all of those things. That can be done if, you, if, you, if the board really wants staff to spend that level of time in determining the cost when um, facility use is not our core business. It's not what we do. We, we choose to spend the time, um, our time, on our core business, which is educating students. But if the board needs us to do that, we will. So I do not have the actual amount that it costs to run it with or without these types of organizations in, but I can assure you it costs. Um, it costs utilities, it costs wear and tear, it costs insurance, it costs, there's all those associated costs. Um, while we are offsetting um, so that they do not have extenuating costs like transportation, if they had to go somewhere else and rent a facility, they would have to transport students, they would have the insurance costs, they would have food costs, they would have custodian costs, they would have all of those costs. Um, so our fees are quite reasonable in the scheme of things. Um, so I can't support Certainly, the board can make any decision they want, but I cannot support and cannot suggest to you that you lower the fees or change the fees. I think the fee schedule is adequate and appropriate and fair. Um, if we take money and supplement for-profit businesses, we are taking money out of students' reach. And that's what the taxpayers allocated the money for was for student services. Glad you mentioned taxpayers because they paid for that building and if <coughs> we as a board or um, school, school principal feels like it's valuable for <coughs> the building to be opened up uh, for the community uh, to use it in that fashion and it's appropriate based on what the school is um, 
wanting to accomplish, then I'm all for it. I don't, I don't want to take that ability away from the taxpayers who paid for that building to begin with and are paying all of the expenses um, of that building. Uh, so I, I think that uh, making that available, and it also doesn't, you know, the proposal I had was, it doesn't change the fee structure. It just gives uh, principals the ability to do what's best for their, their kids, their, their children. Any other comments, board members? I'm just going to see if Mr. Schwartz would mention, because I know there was some guidance from the school board association. I think there was, this was where this policy began, I believe, when we talked about, and back to that discretionary um, kind of missing applying that um, consistently. I think even the example was given in that uh, guidance from the school board association that if the principal goes to the Baptist church, then we may permit you to use the building. If you go to the Catholic church, we don't. Um, that example was even given. So the it certainly seems like it leads down a pretty scary path and if you could just speak to that maybe the the problem with potentially inconsistent appliance leads to the question of why was it inconsistently applied who was it inconsistently applied in favor of or against um and for what reasons and that's where you get into potential legal difficulties um, and i know the policy committee has spent I, I shudder to think how many hours just this year we've spent uh, discussing these policies and the, uh, everything associated with it. And afraid, long ago I worked in insurance and we got many, many, many lessons on risk and being risk averse and not having too many exceptions or not having too many uh, loopholes or uh, variations of, uh, of a policy or of a, of a feature of policies. Um, I, I think what we're doing here is um, adequate and we need to go forward with it and we need to not have a lot of extra risk in here that is going to be hard to administer and not going to be uh, admitted just inevitably would not be administered consistently and consistently and would get us into um, um, issues with the users. So the, the fair application of a clear policy should be our goal as opposed to too many uh, carve outs for too many groups. And back. You want to say? Yeah, one of my questions, I, I know that one of the things was brought to our attention in policy committee and, and also when we were looking at that a lot of the forms were being uh, weren't properly being filled out uh, when they uh, the facility forms they were not done correctly so a lot of these organizations that were saying oh we're being charged too much it was because their forms weren't being filled out correctly I know that one of them was saying they were using two rooms was it ever determined whether they were really using two rooms or two Two facility. I mean, did we find that yeah, out? I think that was it was two different sets of fees, is what it turned out to be. It was like the basic rental. Kelly, is that on the top of the form? It's like the basic <laughs> rental or something. So uh, the form was designed for for two purposes. So um, the top of the form, the fee structure for the top of the form, is all about recouping our immediate costs: utilities, electric, water, sewer, that type of thing. And so that's just a break even for that. Um, but then what you we find in um, many of our other facility use meetings, um, I know there was uh, certainly ones in 2015, I think Mr. Powell, you were on that committee in 2013, um, and then I can go back in records and probably about every two years we address um, this structure. Um, but the, <coughs> the intent was the schools were having out-of-pocket expenses um, like toilet paper, paper towels, those types of things. And so you think about these churches and big organizations that rent our facilities and you have multiple hundreds of people coming in on the weekend on, on Sunday or Saturday. Um, and we give the schools an allotment for their custodial supplies. And so um, they were absolutely screaming. They didn't have, um, so you know, by December, they had run out of allotment for paper towels and, pa and toilet paper. So we had to find a way to recoup the cost associated with the schools that were being rented. So we created the maintenance recovery fee. 
again, the, the basics, toilet paper, paper towels, those kind of things, but also the wear and tear on their furniture. Um, a great example, Ms. Reimer um, has hit me up several times. I know that Jay Robinson is in poor shape as far as their auditorium because it's constantly used. Um, really struggling to look for some replacement of carpets, some replacement of chairs, um, auditorium seating, and that's all because it's what else? Lighting. And lighting. And that's all because of the constant repetitive use. And so um, my suggestion to Ms. Reimer was um, maybe we can do kind of a match situation whereas the school would take some of these maintenance recovery fees and then the maintenance department would then couple that and we would try to update the needs of the school. You all know that our maintenance dollars don't go anywhere close to as far as we need. And so this is an attempt to help the schools to recover their maintenance fees. So One other quick they point. weren't two sorry. rooms. Yeah, there. I'm sorry. Yeah. One other real quick point is um, after school. So as I talked to a couple of the principals that were even in the policy committee, we talked about the custodians being able to clean up right after school and, and what ends up happening. Well, they're expected to clean up when the kids are gone. So when these clubs and different groups are coming in, our custodians can't clean the rooms. They can't clean whatever's being rented until after they've left so that they're ready for the day, the next day. And so Mr. Taylor, as well as a couple of principals just said, you know, there is a, a bigger fee than we really understand when we say if they come in after school because our custodians should be cleaning the rooms empty at that point or whatever auditorium it may be. However, now we're renting that out, so the custodian has to stay extra time to be able to clean up after so our kids come into a clean facility the next day. All right. Um, I think we need to go back to where Ms. Furtenbaugh had before. I mean, these programs are helping kids, so they're, you know, I don't want to see them end. But I also want to see us get some, you know, recover some fees. So is there, can we go back to where you, you were talking about the additional 10% or 10 Kelly, discount. can you still support the 10% we had chatted about? Yes, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that would give these immediate after school programs a 60% discount because they are serving youth. It would be an extra, if you will kind of favor because like I said, there still are folks on campus at that point and they don't have to come back in. If it's okay, I'd like to explain why I can support that 10%. Uh -huh. um, the reason I can support the 10% is because we were not collecting from a number of organizations for facility use that we now know about mm -hmm. right through this updated policy so there it, there will be future revenue that I'm I, that will be coming in mm -hmm. if we adopt this policy whereas before when I calculated on a break even that that revenue wasn't in that calculation because mm -hmm. I did not know these organizations were using the school so when you propose the additional 10 percent the offset of that new was revenue workable. was workable yeah. okay okay so board members do we i guess have a general consensus to ask staff to insert an additional line into policy 5030 uh, for our vote at the 19th meeting if you'll send that to us how you kind of want it written we'll have the attorneys take a look at that okay. and an additional line to deal with which issue it would be in 50 like 30. another category. Uh, let me scroll down here. Yes, so in section D, where it currently says nonprofit organizations shall receive 25% youth organizations, and then it clarifies the nonprofit youth organizations entitled to one discount but not uh, both discounts. I, I would propose it says something to the effect of. Uh, the exception to not stacking fees or to allowing a stacked fee will be for um, if a youth, a nonprofit or youth organization, well actually it would have to be a youth organization because we provided it as a, um, that it was serving only the students already in the building. So it would be something uh, to be stacked with the youth organization for a maximum of 60% discount if they operate in the 90 minutes following school dismissal. Yeah, I actually have that in an email. Yes, yeah, so I think we can just copy that. So um, I can send you guys something and you can word it or tweak it, but, but that's the intent, is that a program fully operates in the 90 minutes after dismissal. Um, so at that point, the custodian is most likely still going to be there and can finish up any final cleanup.
Okay, so y'all okay with requesting that update? Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair? Yes. Under uh, the first question you raised in B with regard to school clubs? Yes. Uh, uh, Ms. Rama referred to Board Policy 3620, uh -huh. uh, extracurricular activities and student organizations. <clears throat> that has a uh, definition of student clubs that includes three different categories, the first of which is school-sponsored clubs and organizations, the second of which is student-initiated non-curriculum-related student groups, those would be equal access groups, um, and the third is non-school and non-student clubs. And I think your suggestion to clarify that language, school clubs, would be um, well taken if we referred to school-sponsored clubs and organizations and student-initiated non-curriculum-related student groups. That sounds Which perfect. would exclude the non-school and non-student clubs. Those are the same terms that are used in Board mm -hmm. Policy 3620. Right. Yes, I just wanted to make sure, I said, because it, there's familiar wording, but it doesn't mean the same thing policy-wise. Mm -hmm. so. Well, um, <clears throat> given the fact that I, I think I remember one of us um, saying that they wanted it to be maybe $1 that we would charge, and I think Mr. Harrison maybe made that comment the last uh, time when you discussed this, um, given that maybe that's not appropriate, David, we probably need to charge more. Um, and the fact that um, the fee for a classroom is $190, I think, a day on the, on the form, and the football field is maybe $90, um, so an, an hour, I think. But anyway, I think there's some uneven costs associated with classroom versus the football field, and so I, I would... I think I could support the percentage off if it were maybe 75%, up to 75%, maybe an additional 25% for those after-school enrichment activities. I think that would allow them to be sustainable and still function as they are currently. Um, that's just my proposal. What do you think, Mr. Walter? As long as we're breaking even on our costs. I think, I, I think we've never done a cost analysis. Yeah. Um, I think there was some like some level of reluctancy to mm -hmm. do um, a full cost analysis okay. for a variety of reasons. I, I'm going to I'll say counter Mr. Powell's proposal with uh, kind of a suggestion. So right now, um, because the organizations who have been inquiring to us um, have operated at no charge. For a number of years and even if we just count this year um, half of the year the board voted to waive for half of the year so in essence uh, they're getting much greater than a 60 percent reduction because half of the year was free and the half would be at 40 percent so it's almost like paying 20 percent so it kind of balances out to what mr powell's proposing and then uh in the next cycle miss klutz whenever that would be i know this is not we certainly don't want your staff to be taken away from um, the core business, as you called it. So um, maybe in the next cycle, whenever that happens, in another couple years, that it, you know, you'll review the numbers again and see if that's appropriate um, based on the fields and the gyms and uh, other things that are on here. So in a classroom right now, it looks like it's on here for $20 between zero and four hours. Um, and the recovery fee, I guess that's the 190. Because um, keep in mind, they're not just in the classroom. They're using the bathrooms and other parts of the building. So I don't want to. So, so it is 190, the recovery fee for classrooms? The is recovery that, is that fee, accurate? the classroom usage is $20. What did you say was 190? I'm sorry. Yeah, it's 20. There's you. two sections of fees on the form. So the top, the classroom use is $20 per classroom, and then the overall recovery fee. So 
Um, what did you say was 190? I'm sorry, I the, didn't hear you. The maintenance recovery fee. For classrooms? Well, that's the category of fall under. It's, it's a general statement, uh, one area of the school. So, so I don't doubt that there's room for improvements, but we have to make sure it balances out and that we're not um, uh, impacting the budget and the maintenance of that building and whatnot. So I'm with a group that has um, rented school facilities on occasion. And <coughs> don't tell anybody, but it was a steal for whatever we did pay. And um, I, a community room next to a school or a church next to a school or any facility that was nearby to a school surely would be recouping significantly more than these rates. Um, we're doing a community service by being so reasonable in these rates and by um, still providing the facility under uh, reasonable terms. Um, we're, we're, we're really struggling here to, to do what does not need to be done. We are being good stewards of the public's facilities and use of their uh, taxpayer resources in the county by um, working productively with these groups and requiring them or expecting them to uh, pony up a reasonable fee. That, that is all. That is all. And a thousand times Ms. Klutz has said, we are breaking even. And we're getting to the point where we're even stretching that um, uh, generosity. Um, let's get this show on the road so that, as a previous board member might have said a long time ago, let's move on and let's get um, something in place so these groups can offer their services at a reasonable amount so that we are uh, have a legal leg to stand on with a piece of paper that says that everybody agreed on certain terms. Um, that, that seems to be the prerogative here that we need to follow. Could I just add one more thing? Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that um, the board members know that um, this is a financial situation. It is about allocating and, and using taxpayers' um, dollars the best way that they were intended. Um, so I want you to know that even our internal organizations that are formed to look like businesses are charged. So we charge our child nutrition program $795,000 a year to use our facility. I charge our Kids Plus program $377,000 to use our facility. And what that does is it allows us to put more funds into the school directly to the students with teacher supplies and all of those things because those are business organizations. They are not for-profit organizations. They are internal. It doesn't mean that we don't think these organizations are wonderful and provide what they need uh, for students and aren't an inter integral part of our, our school system. It's the numbers and doing the right thing with taxpayer dollars is where the rubber meets the road. And in the end, those usage fees, as you said, those, those two particular organizations are enterprises within the district. And that's why we have to have those discussions once a year usually about lunch fees. Can we hold them steady or do we need to raise them a dime? Um, because they have to pay their bills as well. So. Okay, any other discussion? So we will work on the updates for that one line for 5030. Um, get that reviewed by the attorneys um, and then we'll have that on action for the business meeting on the 19th. Okay, if we move to uh, agenda item 5.01, uh, Mr. Lauder, here he comes. And this is regarding, um, sorry, I just flipped my page too fast there. They request from the Harrisburg uh, Town Council to uh, provide an easement for a proposed greenway. Let me, you have some over there too? 
Thank you, Mr. Latter, for getting us this uh, consolidated copy. <laughs> About a month or so ago, um, Jonathan Marshall and I were requested to meet with um, the town of Harrisburg concerning the, um, the Greenway project that they have some funding for, that sort of thing. And um, they brought up where the Greenway was going to go in the alignment. And of course, I told them that, you know, at that point in time, we were crossing two school properties and it would ne be necessary to come to the school board to get approval to do so. Uh, as you can see, Mr. Stein's letter uh, written to you, uh, effectively asking for permission to use that as a Greenway. <coughs> And with that, I'll go back and kind of walk you through what the Greenway project is, best of my ability based on our meeting. Um, the project actually starts above Caldwell Road um, with the parking lot there to be constructed on uh, town-owned property. And then it uh, follows along um, Second Creek. Uh, I think it's downloading. Mine's a little slower over here than it was when I was sitting. But uh, it does uh, travel through the uh, town of Harrisburg property, travels over the creek, and then Parallels, uh, if you want to follow along, it's, it's page one, two, or three sheet. I've got an attachment there with seven sheets showing the entire alignment. It probably takes a while. It's a very large file. Uh -huh. There we go. Uh, on this sheet here, you see it, it starts with a trailhead in the parking lot off Caldwell Road, uh, passes along the creek there on town on property again. It does cross over the creek into the backside of the Orchard Park Homeowners Association property. It does make a connection to Orchard Park uh, and to there. A little community center within the subdivision continues along Orchard Park uh, for quite a ways actually uh, then it passes over into Windsor Forest uh, subdivision and again it makes a connection into Windsor Forest uh, and a cul-de-sac there off that property so they can have direct access to the Greenway uh, goes on to page four it crosses over the, then uh, Robinson Church Road still staying on the south side of the creek uh, and onto the uh, Bridge Point Homeowners Association in which it does come back and make a connection to their community, community center and uh, pool area just um, west of Robinson Church Road. Then it crosses over Robinson Church, uh, Robinson Church Road and uh, or Hickory Ridge Road, I guess, and then it crosses over into Four Square International Church. And after it crosses over their property, then it enters into the Cabarrus County uh, Hickory Ridge Middle School property goes along the creek again still to the south side then crosses over into the Hickory Ridge High School property comes to an end there at the Raging Ridge Lane extension uses a sidewalk to to go down to um, that would be Farm Mill Road not Farm Mill Road I'm sorry that's Stallings Road and then turns into from Stallings Road that has another parking lot at the terminus of the portion of the Greenway on the Cabarrus County property on Stallings Road eventually they would probably seek additional easement that would continue south of uh, Raging Ridge Lane along the creek and to another location of Harrisburg at some time in the future. But that's all the funding they have for at this time. Uh, what I did was Ms. Furtenbaugh asked me to uh, give you a consolidated view of just the, sheet, just, just the portion of the project that basically affected the, the, the two school properties. And that's what I did a handout for you. Uh, we just basically took these drawings and, and overlaid each individual PDF onto a GIS map and then traced basically the, the route of the uh, Greenway, as you can see there, uh, it does travel just north of Hickory Ridge uh, Middle School. It gets within about 350, maybe 400 feet of the back of the, uh, north of the school, uh, across the, on the other side of the uh, practice fields, and then it travels below the detention pond between the creek and the detention pond, and then of course in the wooded area, on out as it crosses over into Raging Ridge Lane. So, now for the Greenway, so I'll use the example of the Greenway that's along uh, George Lyles going towards Roberta Road. Yes, that is, there is fence between the roadway um, and the actual greenway and the path there. So you can't go from the road to the fence or to the actual trail. So will this, do you know what the style of this? Will it be uh, at grade level, completely flat? Is, it, is there going to be fenced or is there access, um, you know, straight through to the school property? My, my understanding is that it will be uh, on grade, except for where it crosses the creek up next to Caldwell Road. It'll have obviously a creek crossing there that will go above the grade. It will be at grade along the fence in the floodplain area. Uh, it will be a paved path uh, with boulders at the end of each, um, where it crosses over the street so no vehicular traffic can obviously decide to take the shortcut or something yeah. across, uh, just like you see on the McEachern Greenway along uh, 136. Where so they have the boulders not allowing you know, 
yeah. vehicles to go past. So how much of the vegetation or tree line on our property needs to be taken out? Uh, very little, as you can see with the route there. It's just outside the tree line, right at the edge of the... Um, um, but you said you plotted this on there yourself, right? That, that's that's pretty darn accurate. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I mean, it's right on top that's, of I would worry about them changing somewhat of the view or perspective of yeah, if, if you will look at what we have today. Page six of the um, project document there, you can see it, that where the alignment is. It's outside the tree line. This is a real-life photography, uh, just 2017 mm -hmm. photography, so you can see it's just outside the tree line. Uh, as it passes by the practice field, but then it does enter back into the tree line as we get to the very far uh, eastern side of the project there next to Raging Ridge Lane. It goes back into the wooded area that's it's basically a 100% floodplain before it comes back out on Raging Ridge Lane. So it will be some clearing of trees along that portion of it just to get you back to Raging Ridge Lane. Now yeah. down where, it, I'm sorry, I have all these questions because I'm always curious about this land, these land things. So where it crosses from the one side of Hickory or Raging Ridge Road to the other side, will there be a crosswalk or some signage or something at that point? Yes, ma'am. They would have a pedestrian crosswalk there, uh, and it would obviously uh, have um, bollards as you enter off Hick Hick Raging Ridge Lane onto the path so that no vehicles could do so. It would cross over and then catch the sidewalk and then walk down the sidewalk. Okay. To the, to now, is that sidewalk we had to put in? That sidewalk's already there. I know, but did we have to put it in originally? Uh, that was put in as part of the Raging Ridge Lane project. There was DOT and, and Cabarrus County and the school system, all three funded that project. Okay, so who maintains that sidewalk a bit? We'll have that, a lot more traffic. That has all been turned, turned over to the town of Harrisburg. Okay, so they're maintaining that? Yes, ma'am. Are well. we voting on this tonight? No, sir. Can you answer your questions this week, possibly, and get those answers? I think other people may have questions, too. We I were think told we can to handle ask them, them ahead of time, correct? You, you ask us to ask them ahead of time. Yes. Obviously, you didn't do that. Well, I did ask. I did study the map, and I asked him to get us a better copy. Okay. Yes, sir. So you could ask questions now instead of ahead of time. <laughs> Just trying to stick to protocol. <laughs> I know you want to get out of here <laughs> for other reasons, and that's fine. We're all anxious the night before, too. Just, um, just following protocol. This land over here, so it was Cabarrus County? Yes, ma'am. That, that wasn't anything we bought before, right? That the county a, just bought an extra piece over there? Yeah, that was part of the purchase of right-of-way necessary to extend Raging Ridge Lane across uh, the creek and tie into far, I mean, to uh, okay. Stallings Road. That was a, a piece of basically it's almost 100% floodplain except for the pier and you see where the parking mm -hmm. lot is. That's the only area of that property that rises up above the uh, flood. Okay. So, board members, Rob? Ms. So are they asking us to donate this land? Are they compensating us for that property, or what's how's it, how does that work? Right now, they're asking us to donate that property. Uh, I've had a discussion with Mr. Steins about compensation. Obviously, it's being donated, and actually, not only being donated, but it's also have contributed capital from the community associations as they cross their property, because that's one of the requirements of development um, for that ring. <laughs> we are required on the um, elementary school site that we're building on Reader Creek to actually provide the greenway on our portion of the project uh, by, by, by the zoning ordinance. However, we've negotiated because it's on the other side of the creek to, to waive that for us on that particular mm -hmm. project. But otherwise, we would, as a developed project, we would include it as part of the design. Um, Mr. Schwartz, the, they're uh, actually asking for an easement. Yes, sir. Not a donation. Not a donation of the land, an easement. Just easement, yes, sir. Not the land itself. Yes, sir. Thank you. But no, Mr. Schwartz, so we have some, uh, like a memorandum of understanding for this? Uh, you could have, is Harrisburg, this is from the town of Harrisburg? Yes, sir. You could have an interlocal agreement for this? Uh, yes, sir. I think the town could probably provide us a legal description of that easement, 25 foot wide, what they're asking for, and give us an actual legal description of that, and then provide it as part of the memorandum of understanding to us for granting that easement to build a project. Is the whole path of this thing in the floodplain, or is part of it? Um, probably 90% of it, sir. Okay. And then the portion, I guess, north of... Raging Red Road between the two football fields. If we were ever to build in that spot, would that affect what we can build there? You're talking between the um, existing football field and Raging Ridge Lane. Uh, talking between the, Harris, the middle school field <coughs> and the high school field on the north side of it. Yes, sir. If you were to look at the topo line, um, as you can Where see, the dotted the dash topo line oh, we're on that about project. The map. Yes, sir. Uh, that dotted dash line um, comes way up in that property. That's why you see no development in that property because it's in the 100% in the 100-year floodplain. 
Uh, matter of fact, our practice field is actually in the 100-year floodplain uh, at, at that as well. Okay, well that answers that question, thank you. Yes, yeah, so that's a good point though, Rob, just to make sure we're not losing any possibly usable land if we would need them to slide it back a little bit further. I don't know if we would have any, I'll say site use, you know, goals for there. Mr. Walter, may I? Uh, I know we were talking about easements, but I'm talking about um, Raging Ridge Road where it, um, where the uh, Greenway would cross over um, Raging Ridge Road. Yes. So my question really is, by allowing the easement and they building a Greenway, and people are riding, running, uh, strolling their babies in a stroller, um, biking uh, across Raging Ridge Road uh, at one point or another, do we need to consider or do we have existing speed bumps at that area where uh, somebody going to or from school is going to be uh, coming off the road and, and moving forward? I mean, I know that road has several speed bumps along it as it as it is today, but what I'm saying is there at the intersection where the Greenway goes over Raging Ridge Road, should we, uh, d uh, do we have an obligation to um, make sure the road is safer for people crossing along the Greenway over the Raging Ridge Road? Well, as we all wish for them to be safer uh, and not to be quick. Si signage is not gonna do it. Somebody's gonna be running or biking across and, 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 and as I said, you know, we always want to be safer uh, and not to be equipped with my answer, but, but that is Harrisburg's problem. Uh, they own the road right of way and maintenance of that road and control anything put into that road right away. So if the town of Harrisburg is building a greenway and the town of Harrisburg feels like that their street, which is Raging Ridge Lane now, is a Harrisburg street, they feel like it needs extra protection, that would be up to the town of Harrisburg and it would not be in an eye building our cart. But it's not in the current proposal, is it? To, I don't to, know to, mo to modify any portion of Raging Ridge Road I, in no. accommodation of the uh, Greenway. The, the final design has not been done. They basically have the alignment right now until they agreed to the easement. They obviously would not do the final design. The final design does not show any. I have not seen any design, final plans, the only preliminary that you see here. And speaking of the liability, if somebody gets injured on this portion of the Greenway, are we liable in any way because it's on our property? No, if we, if we grant this <laughs> as an easement, we would not be. question I have is because it does let, let me let me amend that we we might want to put something in an agreement about the town having liability assuming liability on this yes sir some whole problems there as part of our easement agreement yes sir we leave that to our attorneys to be able to graph that for us <laughs> the only concern that I have about looking at this is the fact that the, the Greenway of course comes fairly close to Hickory Ridge Middle School and uh, and you have a parking lot that's probably a quarter mile away. Um, are they going to install some type of fencing or something, some type of barrier that keeps the greenway separate from our from our school, at least in that area? Um, because you do invite anyone and everyone to walk that greenway, even when school is in session. And uh, I don't know how much we use those bottom fields and, and during recess and or during athletic activities, even after school. So that would be my something that we probably should should think about is how to kind of protect that one little area behind directly behind the school. And you can add, add that to an easement like, agreement. Pardon? Can you add that requirement to an easement agreement? I think we could. I just um, I, I would add just here that um, because it is in the flood plain and in, in that proximity is so very close to the creek it's probably in the flood way they would probably not allow you to put instructions up to catch trash that would flow there as a as an area because our, our field goes completely underwater 100 year flood so you can put a, you put a three foot fence there you can imagine what kind of debris would attach and blow down that fence at any given time it floods which it floods quite often on that creek yeah. so yeah. quite I th often i think we do need to know how close that is like exactly so on the back of the middle school field the track field um what do we have back here is that a berm 
Uh, that's the back of the uh, detention pond. It's about a 12 foot high detention pond berm okay. that separates it because that's that's the actual edge of the okay. uh, 100 year flood where that's where we could actually that's where we had to kind of pull back our detention pond so it did not encroach upon the 100 year flood plain to allow us to build that detention pond. But we have students that, are, that use those fields down behind the school? Students so we use those fields, I guess, during practice time for soccer and uh, football. And I guess, for practice. Mm -hmm. Right, both sports seasons. Um, we have to use our attorney. Can we ask them to recoup some of those costs? What the town of Harrisburg? Whoever we're allowing to use it, is that is that appropriate to recoup those costs if we're using our attorney for that? Well, I think their attorney will will complete the interlocal agreement, and then ours would only review it to cover us. So, so we'll use our attorney a little bit, I guess. Okay, so board members, generally, are you in favor of doing this and asking Mr. Lotto to proceed? Can we put it on action for next week? Next yes, week? it'll be, well, in two weeks, yeah, it'll be on action. Um, but some of these questions he can perhaps get answered in the meantime. I'm so. absolutely in favor of using our facilities to benefit the community. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Anything else, board members? Okay, that brings us to the uh, end of closed session. I will take a motion that the board convene in closed session pursuant to General Statute 143, 318. 11A3 to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the public body in order to preserve the attorney client privilege between the attorney and the public body, which privilege is hereby acknowledged. Uh, and the rest of the uh, motion is in the uh, published in the agenda. So to have a motion to proceed into closed session. Okay, I'll do. Uh, Carolyn uh, made the motion over here, and Mr. Shoemaker made the second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, it's 6 0. Uh, thank you and good evening to our viewing audience and don't we will get to vote. <laughs> and remember to vote on November 6th, although I don't think this will make the tape until then. <laughs>